Thank you very much and good morning everybody. So indeed, I am Mikko Hyppönen. And I have good news and bad news. The good news is that we all, all of us who work with security, we will all be employed for life. There will always be job for us who work with computer security. That's the good news. The bad news is that we will all be employed for life. These problems aren't going to go away. These problems will not disappear. We will never be building 100% secure systems. Now, don't get me wrong. We are getting better. If you compare the kind of security we had on our systems 15 years ago and what you have today, yeah, we are getting better. Indeed, if we would have the same enemy as we did 15 years ago, if we were fighting the kids and teenagers who were writing malware for fun 15 years ago with today's security systems, today's operating systems, we would be in great shape. Unfortunately, we're not fighting the enemy from 15 years ago. The enemy keeps changing. We no longer are fighting kids who write malware for fun. We have completely new kinds of enemies. But I also have to tell you that it is kind of exciting. We are all lucky to be alive during these years. These definitive years for the mankind. Because during our lifetime, the internet appeared. We got the internet, we got the web. This is a major shift for mankind, major new way of communicating. When history books will be written 100 years from now, this time, our time, the first thing they will tell about this time is that the internet appeared and started shaping the way we communicate, the way we, we live our lives. And it's not just the internet and the web that are developing very quickly right now. It's exciting times as well because of the things we're seeing in the development of things like artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, new drone technologies, new nanotechnologies, and robots. And that's why I have robots running in the background here. Because robots are changing very, very quickly. And we get to live during the years when they change from sort of like jokes to something real. And especially the combination of robots and artificial intelligence have been the stuff that we've been reading in science fiction. Now, and now we sort of get to see what it looks like in the real world, which is exciting. So we are lucky to be alive during these years. But there's one thing about robots that has been bothering me, and that's that whenever we build prototypes of modern robots, for some reason we human beings always like to demonstrate the features of our new robots by somehow hassling them, you know pushing them around or kicking them a little bit just to show how, how versatile they are. And it, this is a phenomenon which keeps repeating. When you look, go online to YouTube and watch videos about robots, that's what you'll see. You'll see people pushing robots around or at its extreme, especially with Boston Dynamics, kicking robots around. And this is a bad idea. Don't kick the robots. Do not kick the robots. This seems like a basic evolutionary mistake. Why? Well, robots are getting smarter. As we combine artificial intelligence technologies with robotic technologies, future robots will be smart enough to go to YouTube to watch these videos. And when they see what we did to their grandfathers, they won't be happy. So don't kick the robots. That's a very, very easy thing to keep in mind. And of course, this would all be almost kind of kind of funny until you realize that we've already had our first very real lethal run-ins with the robots. In June, you might have seen the news online from Germany where a man was actually killed for real by a real robot. Happened in Germany happened at the Volkswagen factory. Now, this wasn't really a case of a robot gone mad 
there's a case of a car building robot which was being uh, maintained or it was under maintenance and one of the guys entered the robot's perimeter during its operation then it suddenly started working and the poor man was crushed to death a human being was killed by a robot and when you think a little bit further about what actually happened here this machine is being controlled by computers it's being controlled by software ultimately software killed a man and this is why our work is so important this is why your work is important we all have to understand that what we are working with in today's environment is no longer just about bits and bytes and stuff happening in virtual computer land the electricity in this room is on because of software there's water coming out of the tab because of software the buses are working and running on the streets because of software the breakfast you had was built in food processing plants which run on software. Securing that software is the most important task we have. The thing that we're doing is securing this, not just something that happens on our computers. So you will all be employed for life. And we sort of know this because we keep running into mainstream cases of online security failing. You don't really have to wait for very many days when you read newspapers to run into a headline about some major hack somewhere. Right? Some of you might have heard about this site, right? This week. Ashley Madison. Who were hacked a month ago. The hackers announced a month ago, exactly 32 days ago, that they will they have broken into Ashley Madison, a dating website for married people, so you can have affairs, even though you're married. And these hackers announce that they hate this site and they want this site to shut down. And if they don't shut down, they will publish all the information from Ashley Madison sites, including names of each customer. 30 days later, exactly one month later, Ashley Madison they didn't shut down, and they did publish the information two days ago. Last night, they published another dump. There's two data dumps now published by the hackers of Ashley Madison. The first one included names of 36 million people, um, their IP addresses, their home addresses, their sexual preferences, their names. Yeah, last night's dump included the internal email archives of employees of Ashley Madison and all of their gits, which means all of their source code. Source code to their websites, to their backends, to their applications, to their mobile applications. I was actually tweeting just half an hour ago that I'm a little bit surprised that the website for Ashley Madison is still running right now because the backend source code is out in the web, including the credentials for their sites. Their blog, which is running on WordPress, was shut down roughly two hours ago most likely by the admins because they weren't able to secure it now that the source code and the credentials are out. And 36 and a half million user accounts is a lot. I mean, if you just take the dump by itself, let's do this. <coughs> Where's my mouse? So here we are. That's the dump and if we actually just start searching for email addresses so these are the email addresses in the dump and the numbers you see here are the SQL numbers of the users in the database and this file is a pretty large file we are now at user 2200 and this goes up all the way to 36 million so it would take me the whole day to list these email addresses in fact, 36 million users, if you like, okay, let's say most of these are from USA and Canada. That's what they say themselves. Now, USA and Canada to combined have around 360 million uh, people living in there. 
This is actually the user database of Ashley Madison plotted on the world map. So they obviously have customers from everywhere in the world. But if you just put assume that all of them are from USA and Canada, that would mean that out of adult people, like one in six would have been the customer of Ashley Madison, which obviously can't be true, which sort of s tells you that the customer base is much more international and that there were lots and lots of fake accounts in there, like random accounts, which is obvious if you actually browse around the database of Ashley Madison. Now, there are implications here which go way beyond just ridiculing these people whose names are in the database. No matter what we think about infertility and, and people cheating on their spouses, we still have to remember that all these people are victims of a crime. They are victims. And these leaks could become much more problematic when you combine them with other leaks, especially when you combine them with the leak of OPM. That's the US Office of Personal Management, which were hacked allegedly by the Chinese government last year. And they stole credentials and information about millions of people who have security clearance in the United States. If you actually look at the form SF-86, it's a PDF form which has 127 pages. And that form is filled by every US employee who has a security clearance. And that asks you questions for 127 pages, like your name, where did you live, what was your last address, what was the address before that, What's the names of your children? Which schools do your children go to? Who's your spouse? It also ask questions like, have you ever used illegal drugs? What kind of drugs? Ketamine, THC, cocaine, steroids. It also asks you if you've ever had psychological problems. That's the kind of information which was stolen in the OPM hack. Why is this relevant to Ashley Madison? Because some of these people are in both which makes these people who have a security clearance targets of foreign intelligence operatives. They can use this information about them cheating on their spouses against them to twist their arms. So are there people in there who are in both leagues? Well, of course they are. Associated Press just released last night some information which they were basing on looking at the Ashley Madison leak and not looking at the email addresses but they were looking at the IP addresses and looking at the IP addresses of users who were using Ashley Madison from US governmental IP addresses. And they found users, for example, one from the White House. In fact, they didn't list any names, which of course wouldn't be fair, but they, for example, mentioned that there was two assistant US attorneys who were registered users on Ashley Madison, a IT admin from the executive office of the US president, a government hacker from the Department of Homeland Security, these are the kinds of people who do have security clearance and who were users of Ashley Madison. So let's take a step back. If we are indeed seeing these hacking cases in mainstream media regularly, who are actually behind them? In case of Ashley Madison, there was some hacker who wanted to shut down this website. They had a beef with this website. They didn't like cheating. Maybe they were victims of cheating themselves. Maybe they were grundled employees or ex-employees. In case of OPM, it's alleged that it was a foreign government who was behind the hack. And we can actually split the attackers into different groups. These groups keep, keep on changing. But let's look at some split. So here we have Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek. Great guys, I know both guys, excellent security researchers and hackers. But these are good guys. They hack because they want to find about security vulnerabilities, then they tell the affected parties about the security vulnerability so it gets fixed. Charlie and Chris were the guys who did the infamous Chrysler or Jeep hack, which made the headlines in July. In fact, they hacked those cars already in February. They told Chrysler in February. That we've hacked your cars. They showed it to them already in February. Then they told them that we're going to make this public in Black Hat. Black Hat which runs in the beginning of August. So now you have six months. Please fix your systems. If you don't fix your systems, we're going to go public anyway. So two weeks before Black Hat, Chrysler issued a fix. This worked. It worked exactly the way it was supposed to be. So they are hackers, but they're the good kind of hackers. 
Then we have the bad kind of hackers, like, you know, hacktivists. These are the kind of guys who break into systems not for personal profit or personal benefit. They're not trying to become rich by hacking. But they want to protest. They have a message. It might be a political message. But they are the minority when you compare them to criminal hackers. Guys like him. This is Mihai Giata from Romania who was allegedly involved with running botnets which were stealing people's credit card numbers with a keylogger. So credit card theft, key locking, banking Trojans, ransom Trojans, the kind of cr cyber crime which makes hundreds of millions in profit every single year, being run by organized online crime gangs operating all over the world, but especially coming from ex-Soviet states, from Eastern Europe, from mainland China, and from South America. Then we have governmental hackers, governments themselves, including the governments of the United States, government of Russia, government of China, government of India, government of Pakistan, government of Iran, government of North Korea, and many, many others who are involved in writing malware. So governments writing malware. This is something that would have sounded like science fiction but it's actually happening in 2015. And the parties in government which are involved in developing and deploying malware include law enforcement, military, and intelligence agencies. And then we have the newest entrance to these groups, which are extremists. Extremists and terrorists. And here we don't actually have very good concrete examples yet. But especially movements like ISIS are worrying because they have some kind of hacking capability already. And it's obviously only getting worse. So we have quite a range of different kind of attackers. And this, of course, keeps changing all the time. So I mentioned Charlie and Chris. The car in particular that these two guys hacked is this car right here, a Chrysler Jeep Cherokee. So let me run you a short video clip in which they demonstrate what they did. The car is being driven by Andy Greenberg, an editor for The Wired magazine. After their stunt on the highway, Chris and Charlie still wanted to show me a couple of other tricks. Below a certain speed, they can control the Jeep steering as long as it's in reverse, pop its locks, mess with the speedometer, and, of course, disable the brakes. Okay, hold on time. Hold on. Oh, so yes, it looks pretty bad when you can actually remotely control a car. And here in this demonstration, Charlie and Chris did not modify the car in any way. They had no physical access to the car at all. They were using the fact that the entertainment and navigation system of this car had online connectivity through a SIM card, SIM card from the Sprint network. And they had a SIM card from the Sprint network in their laptops. So they had the same IP range. And they were just port scanning the Sprint network to find Chrysler cars, remotely connect, reflash the entertainment system, which then gave them access to the actual operational systems of the car. So they were able to disable the brakes remotely. And cars have become data centers on wheels. Cars are more and more computerized. This has good and bad effects. Bad effects are that, yes, indeed, they can be hacked. But I wouldn't be so worried about that somebody can disable the brakes on cars. I mean, I'm not worried about random hackers randomly disabling brakes on random cars. Even if it's technically doable, I'm still not worried about that. Why? Because if you disable brakes on random cars, you're going to kill random people. And hackers in general are not interested in killing random people. It's also illegal to kill random people. I'm not very worried about that. I'm much more worried about attacks where Attackers can, for example, just steal cars by hacking them. That's much more likely, because then you can make money. 
And money is a good motivator. Like my mother always used to say, money is good. That's a good advice. Money is good, right? So if there's an attack which results in the attackers becoming rich, those are the kind of attacks that actually will most likely happen in the real world. Self-driving cars and robot cars are a fascinating phenomenon as well, a fascinating idea. The idea that cars can run themselves means that our traffic would be much, much more efficient than it is today. So we can also almost imagine a day where traffic will look like this. The cars will run themselves, people have all learned that the cars will not run you over, you can walk anywhere you want, and the cars will be okay. No jams, no traffic jams, right? I think we all would like a future like this, right? That's kind of neat. So if we can get there, if this is doable, I think everybody would be happy. But of course the downside is that if everything is run by computers, then we, w we are never going to run out of things to do. We will always be employed. So if that's cars, then what about drones? Well, these technologies, of course, developing almost as quickly. We are seeing drones being used for hobbyist purposes, being used by governmental purposes, being used by militaries to actually kill people. And there's quite a bit of privacy implications because of this. You can just fly your drone anywhere you want and shoot anybody's yard if you feel like it. And the interesting development in this is that you can actually go today to a website called dronemunition.com and buy special munition for your rifle, which has been designed just to shoot down drones. So you see a drone over there and you can like, you know, take it down, which is kind of neat. So keep, you can write this down, dronemunition.com, all right? That's a free plug. But it's not just the drones that fly. Of course, we have real planes that fly as well. And once again, the headlines have told us about how planes can be hacked as well. Especially they've been speaking about uh, Chris, Chris Roberts. I don't actually know Chris. I've met him once in DEF CON two years ago. But I can tell you that he's not a madman. In the news stories about his plane hacking, he was typically characterized as someone who irresponsibly took control of an airplane and, and, and tried to do something awful with it. And I don't believe in that at all. He's a security researcher. Very much like Charlie and Chris, he was trying to alert companies like Boeing, Airbus, and Panasonic and Thales about the security vulnerabilities in their systems. Let me actually play a clip in which Chris speaks with uh, Paul Osadorian. Yes, there's a nice control box under the seat that has a, a modified uh, Cat5, Cat6 jack under it to make friends with the in-flight entertainment system. I see. <laughs> But that's the in-flight entertainment system that should have nothing to do with the airplane controls, correct? You hope and you would <laughs> think. <laughs> but that's the in-flight entertainment system that should have nothing to do with the air flight controls. You would hope and you would think. Well, if we look at the official documentation on how we are today securing our planes, the avionics are in fact separate from the in-flight entertainment system which the passengers can access in the plane. And it is separated by cyber security controls. Cyber security controls. Which means that there's a firewall between the avionic system and the in-flight entertainment system. And Chris happened to know the password for that firewall. So how do you actually connect to this network at all? Let's say you are in a plane and Chris claims that he's done this 20 times on 20 different flights. He connected to the in-flight entertainment system with his own devices and from there jumped to the avionics system. How do you actually do that? Well, you do it like this. First you get a seat at the right place. I took this photo when I was flying uh, on seat 4A. So this is the underneath of the seat 3. So I was on uh, 4C and this is the seat 3A. This is on a KLM flight from Amsterdam to Helsinki. So there's, you see this small box there under seat 3A. That's the in-flight entertainment control box. 
And what you do is that it has four screws on it. You open the screws, you untake the cover, and then you find this PCB control board, which has connectors, and you can try to plug your system in those connectors. But it doesn't have anything standard. For example, there's no USB, there's no Ethernet. They have this non-standard cable connection. But you can actually solder your own connector, which looks like this, and then you can plug it into it. And it actually speaks TCP IP to you. It actually gives you a DHCP. You get an IP address from there. And then you can jump from there to the firewall, log in, gain access to the avionics, and you're good to go. But the real question is, how do you actually do this? Like, let's say you are on a plane, and you are starting to unscrew the box. Like, you would think that the passengers around you would, like, scream bloody murder, right? So I don't actually know how Chris did this. I don't know how he did it, but I can tell you how I would do it, all right? The first thing I would do is that I would wait for the plane to reach cruising altitude, right? Then I would open up my bag and I would take out a badge, any badge, just wear any badge, right? right? Then I would, from my bag, take high visibility vests, you know, those yellow vests, and I would put it on, now wearing high visibility vests. And then I would tell the passenger next to me that I'm really sorry, but I have to do some maintenance while we're flying. And then I would start opening up the box. And nobody would say nothing. Because you're wearing the vests. High visibility vests. Which actually, it's an invisibility cape. Which is sort of weird, because it's supposed to make you really visible. It does exactly the opposite. You can sort of imagine that you're sitting in your office, and an unknown guy walks by, but he's wearing the high visibility vests. All right, he's probably doing something. All right. Here we go. Nobody cares. So that's how I would do it. We don't actually know how Chris did it because Chris can't tell us. Because Chris's lawyers tell him not to speak about what he did until all this has been cleared. But like I said, I'm not worried about Chris. Because Chris is not a madman. He's not trying to kill anybody. But these kinds of security risks do worry about us when we think about other kind of attackers kind of attackers who might be interested in using these kind of vulnerabilities to actually do damage. And that's why potential attackers like the Islamic State are so worrying, because they are very hard to understand and very hard to estimate. Like, how do you, how do you make any sense on their attacks? Their attacks don't have to make any sense. And by the way, looking at all these news clips about ISIS really makes me wonder if they are being sponsored by Toyota. <laughs> Probably not, but you know, just makes me wonder. Now, we haven't yet seen cyber terrorism. But obviously this situation isn't getting better. It's getting worse. And ISIS is the first extremist movement which actually has some level of cyber offensive capability in their ranks. So it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. So let me play you a small ad. Have new challenges today. Sensitive data is transmitted over encrypted channels. Often the information you want is not transmitted at all. Your target may be outside your monitoring domain. Is passive monitoring enough? You need more. You want to look through your target's eyes. You have to hack your target. You have to hit many different platforms. So this is a video ad for a company called Hacking Team, which once again is a case which has made the headlines during this summer. A company from Milan in Italy, which was making all of its money by selling malware. Malware which could be used to hack targets. However, they were apparently breaking no laws when they were doing this. Why? Because their customers weren't criminals. Their customers were governments. They were selling their hacking tools and malware to governments around the world, which then used their tools to do investigations. 
And I don't really have a problem when law enforcement uses tools like these to find criminals. But I do have a problem when they do it without citizens knowing that it's being done, when they do it without any kind of transparency. And I especially have a problem when this is not being done in countries which have freedom of speech. So this is the website of uh, Hacking Team. And let me actually play you another clip. This is uh, from an interview with a guy called Eric Rabe, who worked and still does work for Hacking Team. You'd be able to uh, see all of the keystrokes you know, that the, the uh, operator uh, used. You'd be able to go into their uh, memory, find out what the documents were stored there, what information is available on that machine. If they used uh, Skype, you'd be able to monitor that call. You'd be able to turn on the camera, the microphone, when the subject was unaware of it, and hear and see what was going on in front of the computer. All of those kinds of capabilities. So it's, it's quite, I mean, it's a very powerful system. And uh, as I say, I recognize a lot of people find that to be perhaps uh, frightening. Yeah, I'm not surprised either that some people find this to be frightening. And I find it especially frightening when we look at some of the customers they had, because their customer base included governments of Sudan, Ethiopia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan. These are not really countries which are known for their human rights record. So when democratic countries in the West sell tools to governments which use those tools to oppress people who are looking for their freedom of speech, something is clearly wrong. And all of these governments were customers of Hacking Team. How do we know this? Well, we know it because Hacking Team was hacked in June and the unknown hacker released their email history and their customer list. That's the customer list of Hacking Team, which mentions all these governments and many others. Finnish government was not a customer, by the way. At least it's not listed here. Interestingly, Hacking Team did have our uh, software news. They had a three-user license for F-Secure uh, secure antivirus, which they were testing regularly against their malware to fi figure out when, whenever we detected their malware, they would try to modify it accordingly. They had really hard time, according to their own internal wiki, to bypass our generic exploit detection, which is of course nice. And all these leaks coming from the hacking team hack lead to, for example, Adobe releasing an unscheduled update because they had a zero-day vulnerability in Flash, which was being used and sold by Hacking Team to their customers so they could actually hack their victims. Another way Hacking Team tools were used to hack their victims was through iPhones. They actually had an iPhone app, which claimed to be the New York Times application, which was actually breaking into your iPhone and giving the attackers access to your messaging and your location. So that's hacking team. But then we have other kinds of problems, especially problems with privacy. So security, obviously problematic. But privacy is a completely different problem. Because when we look at our problems with privacy, the most prominent attackers who go after our privacy are not criminals at all. They're companies like Google, like Facebook like Twitter. What's common with all these companies and many others like them is that they are free services. You pay nothing. You pay no money to use any of these services. Yet they make billions in revenue. And the way to see how this works is to go and use these sites not as a user but as a customer. Which means you go to these sites and you buy an ad. Because then you see how they target and how well they can target their users. So for example, when you go to Twitter, and I use a Twitter a lot, I have 100,000 Twitter followers, so I kind of like Twitter as a way of reaching people. But I don't really like the way they make money on the system. Because when you go to Twitter and start an ad campaign, it gives you this targeting inter interface in which you can actually target the, the ads to your users. So obviously you can target based on like where the people are, Twitter knows where you are, based on your interests. Twitter knows what you're interested in based on who you follow, right? But then it gets a little bit unsettling when you can start to target users based on things like uh, 
you know, whether they've recently had a baby or whether they've recently moved or whether they are in their late teens or target users based on their family position, like are you the grandfather of the family or the grandmother of the family, or based on how much money you have. So maybe it's a bit surprising, but Twitter actually knows how much money you make. And now it starts to get clear that this information is not coming from your tweets or not coming from who you follow on Twitter. It's coming from somewhere else. Twitter also knows what's your occupation, like where do you work, and it also knows what kind of credit cards you have in your wallet, it also knows what kind of booze you buy from the shops, and uh, for example this detail, they know which women buy plus-sized clothes, so they know how large you are. And this information isn't coming from your tweets, it's coming from customer consumer information databases built by companies you've never heard of. Companies like GPG or Axiom or Datalogix. And they collect this information not from online world at all, but from the real world. They buy this information from shops, from credit card companies, from insurance companies, from frequent buyer clubs. And then they collect dossiers on all of us. And then they sell this information to companies like Twitter. Twitter actually pays money to buy this information about us. Which leaves us with one question. How do they then connect this consumer spending information to the Twitter account? Like how do they know which account is which? And the answer is that they combine this information based on your mobile phone number. Your mobile phone number is the unique key that combines your online account to your real-world spending account. That's why they ask for your mobile phone number. And it's typically shown to you as a security feature. Please give us your mobile phone number so you can enable two-factor authentication. Very nice. This is also one of the reasons, I think, why Facebook paid $22 billion for WhatsApp. Not to really get a chatting service, but to get the mobile phone numbers of hundreds of millions of existing Facebook users, so they can target them better. And this is all legal. It's all legal. They, they aren't breaking any laws. We allow them to do this. We give them the permission to do it. They ask us the permission and we give it to them. Yes, I have read and I agree with the end user license agreement. And of course, if we would really read the end user license agreement, we wouldn't agree. But I suppose the biggest surprise during the years I've been working in security has been the fact that governments entered the picture as authors of malware. The very first governmental malware case that I worked with was in 2003. And that case was a case involving a defense contractor company in Europe which was being hit by an attack which we believe was coming from PLA, from People's Liberation Army, from mainland China. But since then we've seen attacks from multitude of different countries. Earlier this year we heard news about White House computer systems getting hacked, allegedly by the Russian government. And that makes you wonder like, okay, for example, what kind of system is that? Well, actually, if you look closer, that seems to be, seems to be a Dell the Dell E series, the Dell Latitude, I think, maybe Dell E6430, maybe 6420, running. What do you think? What do you think it's running? Windows uh, Vista, maybe? XP? OS X? No. <laughs> I don't think he's running OS X. Actually, you can find pictures of Obama doing his work on his iPad, so he, he does use Apple devices as well. Actually, there are photos of that computer from the other side. It's running Windows 7. So we actually know that. So trying to target a system like that isn't very hard when you can actually like, figure out what kind of systems guys like these run before you even start your attack. But the United States, of course, is an attacker themselves. We've learned quite a bit about the kind of offensive action coming from the United States over the last two years. But there are countries that are much smaller that are active in this game as well. Earlier this year, around January or so, 
there was an attack which was launched from Israel which targeted this company. And this is the headquarters of Kaspersky Lab in Moscow. In January, one of their analysts was building a new prototype of a piece of software which would try to detect unknown advanced malware, the kind of malware that governments typically write and deploy. So he wrote the first prototype, he compiled it on his computer, he took the binary and he ran it. And to his surprise, the first prototype detected an anomaly in the memory of his own workstation. And he was really confused, and he read the source code again, and recompiles again, it still does, really weird. So he gives the binary to his friend next to him, and he runs it on his workstation, and it finds the anomaly from there as well. And then they slowly start to realize that they have been hacked. And this is a security company, one of the leading security companies in the world. And we really have to give Kaspersky credit for publicly talking about this case. Most companies would have never told the world what had happened. So we have to give them credit for full disclosure. But it also makes you wonder that if security companies, companies can't secure their own networks, how well can we hope to secure our customers' networks? We need new kinds of solutions. And that's part of the good news, which means we'll always be employed. We will always be needing new kinds of solutions. But the other side of the coin is the bad news. I actually went to read the Geneva Convention. That's the convention which describes, amongst other things, the rules of war. And in their definitions, they define what is a legitimate target. Like, what's a legitimate target during a time of war for military action? And the way I read that is that our company would nowadays be a legitimate target during a time of crisis. A legitimate target, for example, for bombing. And that's not a very comforting thought. And that's definitely not what I signed up for almost 25 years ago, when I started analyzing viruses spreading on floppy disks. I definitely didn't sign up for this shit, but this shit is where we are. So I have good news, and I have bad news. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Miko, for a very interesting and entertaining talk. I suppose we will have lots of questions from the audience. So, any questions from, from the audience? Yes, please, on the back. Can you help him with the, with the mic? Is this the only one? Oh, my God. Um, thank you for the talk, it was great. So you've mentioned both robotics and uh, personal information. And <coughs> in terms of robotics, earlier this year, there have been opinions that uh, artificial intelligence is actually a threat to humanity. So this is a kind of a red line we should not cross. Uh, now, when it comes to personal information and disclosing personal information, do you think there is a red line there? Or are we moving towards a, like a full transparency society like with cases like Ashley Madison? And what are the implications of that? I think the core of the problem with the privacy issues we have today is how the history of the web happened to develop. Like when the web came around, it was clear that we will be wanting to have lots of content online, like you know, news and media and entertainment and movies. And then the question is, how do you pay for that? Like if there's going to be newspapers online, they have to be making money somehow. And in the early days, it wasn't obvious at all how that's going to work. Like one model would be that people actually pay money for news, that the browsers would have a payment mechanism and you would pay money for your online content just like you pay money for physical content in the real world. But for, I guess, a matter of luck or fate or something, that never became a thing. Instead, we started paying for content with our profiles and with our data. 
So all these companies make money by profiling us and, and gathering data on us. And now users have learned that on, on the internet everything is free. Everything is free. You're not supposed to pay for anything online. Searches are free, YouTube is free, Gmail is free, all the content is free, mobile applications are free, and of course none of them are free. There's no free lunch. But it's very, very hard to change that anymore. So maybe we have crossed the line, and maybe we will never gain the kind of privacy we had before the web. I love the web and I hate the web. I guess there's no going back. Other questions? Over there. Hi, and thanks again for a very nice presentation. You mentioned about the seat that we are in. So what can we do to get out of that seat? I mean, we cannot just rely on the morality of the government not to attack mm -hmm. security people. So any thought on that? Well, if I would have an easy answer to how do we get out of this shit, I would have given it. But there are no easy answers. The core problem is that these systems are being built by human people, people like us. And we people make mistakes. We will never build perfect systems. We always have bugs in our code. And before the internet, bugs in our code were not that serious. A bug would mean that your application or your operating system would crash, and then you would reboot, and you would lose some data, but that's it. Today, because everything is connected, those very same bugs are vulnerabilities, security vulnerabilities. So the only solution, the only way out of this is something I don't like either, and that's taking human beings out of the loop so that our software would no longer be developed by people, but by, once again, artificial intelligence. So the day when we are able to build the first prototype of a system which is able to program just a little bit better than we are, that's the last day we have to program anything at all. Then from that moment on, we, we are number two. We can no longer program better than a computer. And of course, the, pro the computer can pr program better artificial intelligence, so it very quickly becomes something we can never catch. And they might be able to write perfect code, or close to perfect code. But it's also a very scary thought. It seems like a basic evolutionary mistake to invite a superior intelligence into your own biosphere. But that seems to be what we're doing. Do we still have time for one more question or one last question? All right. The question was, how many times has F-Secure been hacked? That's a great question. Well, if we have been hacked, the attackers have been good enough that we haven't detected them. Is that a good answer? There has been attempts. But as far as we know, honest truth, we haven't been breached. So if the attackers are in, they're really, really good. Thank you very much.